God is good. All the time. Amen. Would you turn your Bibles once again to 2 Corinthians, this time the first chapter. And when you hear the word delivery, what do you think of? I think if you're of a certain generation, maybe you think of the milkman who delivered milk to your home. Uh, on a daily basis. Maybe you think of the male man, male woman, male person who delivers the mail to you. Um, perhaps you think, uh, if you like pizza once in a while, of the pizza man who appears on your doorstep with supper in hand. I want to tell you as you're looking up the passage about an actual exchange on Twitter between an angry customer and a Domino's pizza. The customer tweeted, yo, <laughs> I don't know if you're required to open a Twitter, a tweet, tweet with the word yo, but this one did. I ordered pizza and it came with no toppings on it or anything, it's just bread. <laughs> and Domino's tweeted back and said, we're sorry to hear about this. Then a few minutes later, the same customer responded, saying, never mind, I open the box upside down. <laughs> Delivery not made. <laughs> Nonetheless, it happened. I read about a company uh, feeling it was time for a shakeup who hired a new CEO with a reputation for ridding the companies that he led of slackers. In fact, this was one of his uh, main uh, abilities, uh, one source of pride. So on a tour of the facilities, the CEO noticed a, a guy leaning against a wall. He saw a chance to show everyone that he meant business. So the CEO walked up to the guy who was leaning up against the wall and said, how much money do you make in a week? About 200 bucks, the young man replied. Why? The CEO reached into his wallet, handed him $200 in cash, and screamed, Here's a week's pay. Now get out of here and don't come back. Feeling pretty good about his first firing, the CEO looked around the room and asked, Does anybody know what that slacker used to do around here? And one of them chuckled a bit and said, He's the pizza delivery guy. <laughs> Today we're going to look at the subject of delivery and God as our deliverer who never fails. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, let's start with verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. 
He has delivered us from such deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted to us in the prayers of men. May God, who gave these words, give us to understand and to live according to them. From our earlier reading and this one, we understand that Paul actually wrote four letters to this church in Corinth. Two of them have survived and have become part of the Bible, part of our New Testaments. And one of the reasons that Paul kept writing to them was to defend his ministry from critics within the church. You see, false teachers in the church in Corinth kept trying to elevate themselves by dragging Paul down. And so Paul wrote to them to correct this, these false teachers. In our section this morning, Paul is attempting to defend the authority of his ministry in a rather unusual way. He's saying to them effectively, look, nobody has suffered for the cause of Christ more than I have. I brought with me uh, one of my commentaries this morning, and you can't obviously see it from there, but you can see that. There's a sidebar in the commentary here, and it's in orange color. And this is a listing of all of the things that Paul suffered during the time of his ministry, including beatings, imprisonment, illness, poison. Uh, you know, the list just goes on and on and on. And so when Paul writes to them and says, we have suffered on your behalf, He's not talking about having the sniffles. He's talking about some very serious suffering. To his credit, Paul never turned to his sufferings as reason to complain or any other kind of sin. Instead, he always turned them to good, brought glory to God, and directed to pay people's attention to Jesus as our deliverer. Folks, here's what we want to see today. God delivers us from death to himself. God delivers us from all of the experiences of life that are challenging and difficult to himself. Message notes are in the bulletin. If you'd like to use them to follow along, we're going to notice two things along this point this morning. The first is that God delivers us again and again. And the second is that God is delivering us for a purpose, and that is to make us partners with him in this ministry of deliverance. We are delivered again and again. If you look at verses 8 through 11 of our passage today, Paul is obviously writing a very personal section here. He didn't want the church to be unaware of the difficulties that he had encountered while ministering on their behalf. His troubles were both personal and profound. They were personal, we can see this clearly in his repeated use of the word we in verses 8 to 11 that he's referring to himself and to his uh, co-ministers and the leaders of the church in Corinth. He said that these troubles weren't meant to be just troubling, but that they serve a divine purpose. They draw us closer to one another and closer to God. Imagine how much more depressing the troubles of life would be if they serve no purpose. You know, we look at, at uh, people in our culture who, who 
do not believe in God, who have not accepted Jesus as their Savior, want to take a, uh, a solely scientific view of life. And, and what meaning does life have for them? What meaning and purpose do their troubles have apart from drawing us closer to God? And as I said and demonstrated with this commentary, the troubles about, about which Paul is writing were also profound. As people of faith, we don't pretend to be chipper, or we don't feign strength when we face troubles. We don't make light of them to impress others. People of faith are just as deeply affected by grief and loss as any other people. What we have as people of faith is God as our deliverer from these trials. Paul's choice of words in verses 8 and 9 convey a deep emotional impact on his circumstances. He said in verse 8, we were under great pressure. And this may refer to the various persecutions that Paul suffered imprisonments that he undertook. He said also in verse 8 that we despaired of life itself. If you've never been in that place, you don't know how that really feels. God gets you through. And he said third in verse 9, we felt in fact like we were under the sentence of death, that we didn't have anything to look forward to. Now Paul's point here is not to arouse sympathy or pity or boasting, but to do two other things. One, and this is the primary one, to glorify God as deliverer. What does he say specifically in this passage? He says this happened, these troubles, these trials happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises us from the dead. These things happen so that he would learn not to rely on his own strength, but to rely instead upon God's strength. He also wrote that God has delivered us and he will deliver us again. He wrote that we have to set, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. My friends, that is a fine, fine lesson to learn when we're facing trials or troubles of any kind, when we have an illness, when we're sorrowful, if we would learn and remember that God will deliver us. These things are temporary. We will prevail. The second thing he wanted to do was to thank the church in Corinth for their prayer support. And prayer figures prominently in this passage. We tend to reflect on the personal effects of our experiences and our illnesses. But Paul here is showing a broader vision by thanking the church for their prayers during that time. He wrote, as you help us by your prayers. And he promised in verse 11 that many will give thanks on behalf of the gracious favor granted to us in answer to the prayers of men. So our first thought always when we hear of a brother or sister in need, when we hear about someone who's sick or is having difficulties, is to pray. Sometimes we say, well, all I can do is pray. Great. That's the most important thing. That's the first thing that needs to happen in this first step toward their healing and resolution and deliverance is prayer. The greater the suffering we face, the more we feel loved and the closer we draw to God and one another as we overcome these sufferings. Now that doesn't mean that the cause of our suffering is always going to go away. We think that being de 
know, whatever it means that I don't have those symptoms, I don't have those problems, I don't struggle with that attitude anymore. But being delivered means something much more significant. It means that I have learned how to prosper in my want. I have learned how to smile in the dark moment. I have found triumph in God in the hour of my greatest need. Paul himself had what he called a thorn in the flesh. And he prayed to God to take it away. And God said, no, I'm going to let you keep that because I want you to know and to tell others that in your weakness, my strength comes to the fore. And if something is in your life, friend, and it is a heavy burden to you, give it to the Lord. You were not meant to carry that. Give it to him and allow him to deliver you through it. The other purpose that God has in allowing things to come into our lives, things that are unwelcome, things that are difficult, is so that we might be comforters for one another. We look at the verses 3 to 7 here to find this truth. We learn, first of all, about God. And we learned that giving comfort is what God is all about. Giving comfort is what God is all about. In verse 3, how does Paul describe it? The Father of all compassion. The God of all comfort. Verse 4, who comforts us in all our Troubles. Do you hear the word all there prominently? Not just the big troubles. Not just the mountain-sized challenges, but the day-to-day -day stuff. The details of life. God is in all. The word here for comfort is the same one used to describe the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14. The comforter. It means one who stands alongside to help. God stands alongside you to help. You. Then in verse 5, Paul wrote, Just as we share in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds where? Through Christ. The sufferings of Christ does not refer to the passion of Jesus that we observed on Good Friday but to the things that his followers suffer that are similar and with which we can identify with him. Jesus is the source of all comfort. We notice also that giving and receiving comfort is what God's people are all about. Giving and receiving comfort is what God's people are all about. Here's the key, folks. Paul saw his suffering as contributing positively to spiritual maturity. Paul saw his suffering as contributing positively to spiritual maturity, his own and the maturity of the believers in Corinth. Now we're familiar with human nature. We have repeatedly observed that the most sympathetic counselors are the people who have been through the same experiences, right? Somebody's been through it. You have a connection between the two of you. Paul affirms that truth, but also tells us of the emotional benefits of suffering in five expressions found in verses 4 to 7. I'm going to ask you to look at these and we're just going to note them. Because he's really saying the same thing in five different ways. Why do things come into our lives? Look at verse 4. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. 
Look at verse 6. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. And again, if we are comforted, it is for your comfort. Verse 6, your comfort produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. Our hope in you is firm, he wrote in verse 7, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. The question raised in the title of this morning's message may seem pretty easy to answer. When you're sick with real problems or worries, when you're hedged about with difficulties, when you're down and grieving, why wouldn't you want to be delivered? I've had the opportunity to be ill for a few days over the last few weeks, and I have prayed for God to deliver me from that illness. I have prayed for my mother, as you have, to be delivered from her illness. So it seems a pretty obvious question, doesn't it? Who wants to be delivered? But it's human nature also to complicate things, so that even deliverance is not so obvious as it first seems. For example, if you're holding a grudge, are you afraid to be delivered from anger? Do you pray to be delivered from conflicts? Do you pray to be delivered from your status as a victim? Do you pray for deliverance when you know it will mean a change in your life? Let's be honest. The person who stands most squarely in the way of your deliverance is the person in the mirror. We have to want to be delivered. We cannot allow anything in this life, any ambitions, any passions, anything of this world to get in the way of our own deliverance. God has promised us to deliver us in our trials. That means that he is wanting to change us. He's wanting to improve us. He's wanting us to know the joy that comes and the satisfaction that is ours when we have done the hard work of remaining true resting upon his strength. Yes, we struggle, but we are delivered. Amen? Amen. Let us conclude our service today by singing about the place to which we would like to be delivered, wouldn't we? We'd like to be in the garden with the Lord, Sharon's going to lead us in the singing of our concluding.